me introduce Sean. He's from uh, a Pasquia Cree Nation in northern Manitoba. Uh, he puts up front, which I, I admire, being a, a father, uh, being a, a son, an uncle, a husband, uh, prior, and more importantly, to being a teacher, a student, as well as a traveler and a knowledge keeper. Uh, he's a community psychologist, uh, a researcher, and an educated uh, Cree. He straddles in indigenous and mainstream worlds. I understand that straddling sometimes is, I see it as uh, two boats. We have a connection here, the paddle being held by somebody in each of the boats. I know how difficult that straddling can be. Uh, most of this time has been teaching other indigenous knowledge seekers on how to accomplish this balancing act while keeping both feet on the ground. Describe it. In addition to being a full-time dad, uh, he works part-time, still on the at Northern River Junior's Department of Rural Health. <laughs> the University Center for Rural Health. Okay, University Center for Rural Health. Same place, different name. Okay. At the University of Sydney in Australia. Uh, he has intention to continue traveling in the and uh, to further articulate Indigenous knowledges and research paradigms. Uh, his research focuses, and I'm sure there's additional focuses of uh, concept of identity, health and healing, and culture and well-being. His doctorate is in social sciences and indigenous studies. From Monash. Monash. His most recent, one of his most recent publications is with uh, Rick Sparkley, uh, Sterling and Tong, Service Providers Perspectives, Attitudes and Beliefs and Health Service Delivery for Aboriginal People. Receiving him Communal dialysis in rural Australia, a qualitative study. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. That's why I didn't say that. Spell dialysis. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyways, I, I, I hope you could uh, give a warm welcome to Sean, who will be with us for the next 45 minutes. Or I was just going to have like a question and answer, but it seems like there's so many of you, I thought maybe I should do a little talk. Just Interrupt at any time you want. You can see that I believe in the three R's because I'm going to recycle the presentation I did yesterday. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so that's where I'm from. Pasqua Creation, which everyone knows is the center of the universe, <laughs> or my universe. Um, Michael already talked about this, but and that's some of the roles that I have. Um, you know, it's kind of strange, like whenever you're, when you meet people, um, indigenous people, just about anywhere, the first thing you do is like, well, a lot of places they shake hands, but a lot of places they don't. But um, one of the first things you do is you start to talk about, like, oh, where are you from? And it's like, that's almost like a cold way of finding out if someone's Aboriginal or not. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> they say, oh, I'm from the Pacific community, and then you go, okay. <laughs> yeah, he's yeah, Aboriginal. But, you know, if they say Winnipeg or something. It's like, oh, I don't know, it could still be Aboriginal, but maybe not, so you start to have to ask a few more questions. But, or it, a lot of Aboriginal people will say, I'm from, I live in Winnipeg, but my, I'm from Fisher River or, you know, wherever, so they'll say where they live, but also say where they're in all the communities. Um, then the next thing you do is you start to say, oh, I was here from OCN, and so do you know Alex Wilson? No, oh, that's my sister. Or, do you know this person or that person? And you go through until you find someone that you, in common or if you can't find anyone that you know in common it could be like well I, I would say well so I'm from I'm from Opasquare but I live in, in Lismore in Australia and they'd say well I've been to Australia I was at, at this conference in Wollongong and I'd say oh I was at that conference or you know you go through this thing of sort of like question and answer where you try and find some sort of common ground where you either got a person that you both know in common or you both these days like with Academics, all conferences that you've been to, <laughs> to this, that, or get a conference together, or this training thing, or that. So there's like a whole sort of uh, dance that you go through of establishing relationships because you want to know where this person fits in your web of relationship. And I think so. But when you're like doing something like this at university, it's quite different because you don't really get a chance to do that. Like if I'm up here, it's hard for you guys to all sort of engage with me that way, right? So you have to sort of introduce new protocols and new ways. Of so that's why, you know, the Western protocol of introducing yourself is quite different. But it, I, you know, suppose serves the same sort of process where 
hopefully you guys get to understand where I fit in your web of relationships. So that's the sort of information that Michael was giving up what I was Hopefully you understand where I'm coming from. Other than a center of the universe. <laughs> right? That's where I'm from. <laughs> um, so those are my boys. Mind you, they're a lot older now, but it's hard to get them to sit still. <laughs> Actually, the little one's now 8 and 11 and 14. Um, Do they know that you're still using this picture? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I wouldn't be able to get permission from them. <laughs> so I've got old, expired consent. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that... I, I often try to think about, or I use a lot of metaphors in, in what I do. Um, so I was thinking, that a, a good metaphor that I like to think of is, that's an island, that's in Clearwater Lake in northern Manitoba. Well, not really that much, it's more like the middle of Manitoba. And all of you guys will probably, if you're from Manitoba, you'll recognize that that's what an island looks like, right? Unless you're maybe you're from really far north, then an island's going to have the trees on it. But if you were from, say, like Australia, or if you lived in Hawaii or a different country, that island, you'd recognize that island would look quite different. Right? Or if you closed your eyes and imagined an island, it would, you'd come up with a different picture in your brain. And we all know that that island is missing something out of the picture also, right? Because underneath the island, everyone knows that an island is just a mountain that's poking up out of the water, right? So if, there, if it wasn't for what's underneath that island, the top of it wouldn't be sticking out and those trees wouldn't be able to grow. It would just be all underwater and you wouldn't see it. Are you with me so far? Are you in agreement there? Mm -hmm. well, I like to use that sort of as a, <coughs> as a uh, metaphor for how culture is. So I think that our culture, the visible part of our culture, is like the top of that island. So and that's the things that are, are visible are like the clothes that we wear, um, the words that we use, uh, the buildings that we're in, the music that we listen to, our dance, what we eat. Um, so those are the things that are easy to see. But it's really important to recognize that there's a whole mountain underneath that visible part that's holding it up that makes that part visible. And that's the philosophy that we have, the beliefs that we hold as a people, are more important. That's what holds us up. Because you guys all recognize that that island's going to look different in the winter time, right? That there's not going to be any leaves on the trees. It's going to be covered in snow. But it's still going to be the same island. The underneath part's still the same. It's the same with culture. So you can, in different, different contexts or different environments, the visible part's going to change. Um, but just because the visible parts change doesn't mean the underlying core changes. So it's like I don't have to stand here in buckskins and eating, uh, well, not even eating bannock, that's not even traditional food. You know, I can, I can <coughs> eat Chinese food and listen to rap music. That doesn't make me any less Cree. What makes me who I am is my beliefs inside of me. So hopefully you all recognize that, right? So like, like you know, Many of you may be Aboriginal, but doesn't mean you're sitting around here in fur, furs and just came in off the trap line. We can live in the city and still be who we are as people. As long as we hold our beliefs. Um, okay, I'm going to skip through the next part. Well, actually, this next part is actually kind of, maybe kind of important for those of you that are in social work, because I, can't, I think it's kind of ties in with social work a lot. I am, kind of ties in with peace studies a lot too, but anyway. I think that a lot of time I talk about like, you know, where we've been and where we're at now and where I would like to see things go in the future. So I think that where we've been in the past has come from a place of subjugation. Right? And everyone knows like the long colonial history of, uh, of the Americans. So, you know, for the five, past 500 and whatever years we've been um, resisting colonization, but not it's not just the physical parts of colonization, there's also hegemonic sort of ways that our ways of thinking and our ways of doing things, our ways, our ways of being in the world have been attacked. So it's not just the physical 
the physical part of <coughs> colonization, there's like a real mental aspect to it too, where you're attacking those people's philosophies, like, and that's the core of really who we are. And there's been resistance to that. Um, so I think the place that we're at right now is in a place of resistance, so we're actively resisting what's happened to us. And I, or we're reacting to what's happened to us. And I think that that reaction has kind of taken place in two different ways. So for people who are, have had a certain level of resilience, so they've been able to um, have enough, re well, enough resilience to sort of uh, hold themselves up against colonization. There's been a, a process of decolonization, so people have recognized what's happened through colonization and trying to, to actively fight against that. The other, um, I think for a lot of people that don't have that resilience, the, the response to colonization is a lot of times often is internalized violence or lateral violence. So it's like you take that stuff on yourself so you have a really negative view of yourself, or you spread it out laterally. So there's, you know, instead of fighting back against oppression, you tend to oppress other people. So there's, I see a lot in our communities right now, a lot of homophobia, a lot of misogyny, and sort of, it's easier to attack women and attack gays or attack whoever than it is to sort of stand up for yourself. So unfortunately, that's a lot of what happens. And a lot of lateral violence is also, you guys will find as you get educated, it gets directed at, educated at, which, you know, we get called apples or we get called whatever, accused of being less Aboriginal because we're successful at university. All right, so that is, the, unfortunately, a way a lot of stuff is right now. But what I would like to see is changing from a place of we're reacting to where we're at a place where we are choosing to act. And to me, there's a really big difference between reacting to someone else and choosing to act from where you want to go and what you want to do. Okay. <clears throat> so that's, that's sort of... That's my sort of vision of the future, where I'd like things to go, is that we're not just surviving, we're not just getting by and doing okay, but we're flourishing. We're growing, we're like a growing, we have growing cultures, we're, grow, we're like growing, growing nations. And we're flourishing through Saki Uwewin, which is love in action. So it's, we, we are guided by love in our actions. So that's sort of, the philosophy that I'm sort of guided by these days. Um, so I guess I could extend that metaphor to, it's just, like that's how culture works. So there's the visible part and there's the invisible philosophy of these, but that also works the same with research. So there's the visible part of research, which is your, you know, your data collection and your data and whatever, but there's also a whole invisible part underneath that is the philosophy behind why you're doing it. Um, Okay. Uh, I feel like I'm talking too much now, so we've got some questions. I'm not going to talk more until someone asks a question. Can you explain that last term that you had mentioned before, the love yep. through action? I've never heard that before. Uh, uh, that's just, what it means is love in action, so it's like you're acting with love in your heart, or your, your actions are guided by love. Is that great? So it's not just something that we feel, but it's something that we use to guide how we act. Um, I guess I just have a question in regards to what you see as uh, the future Well, it's a reaction to colonization, is to decolonize. So you try and actively <coughs> fight against the, what's happened through colonization. Do you think that an individual can fully be decolonized? I'm not saying decolonization no, no, no. is a bad thing. I, I, I agree. <laughs> like, I feel like it's a forever evolving process, yeah. right? So. But, and I think that it's necessary to some degree because you know, it's like when you're in a shitty situation, you have to recognize that it's a shitty situation before you can do anything to change it. 
but it's like racism and sexism and homophobia and whatever, you can fight against those forever. And they're never going to go away. Um, so you can all you can spend your life fighting against something, or you can instead guide yourself towards something better. So it's like you're always fighting against something. What are you what are you putting up as an alternative? Right? Um, so I think that's a, a sort of a big problem sometimes. Yeah? How do you think one might go about guiding themselves towards be better? They can't it. Yeah, well, it may be necessary first step to fight against it, but you also have to have an alternative, right? I think, or like a vision of of why you're fighting. What is it that you're fighting for? So it's more than just saying no to something. What's your alternative? Yeah. It's not just no. Yeah. Because well, I mean, as social workers, it's like. Really, you know, if you were doing your job perfectly, you wouldn't be needed anymore, right? Because <laughs> social workers are, <coughs> by definition, something that shouldn't be needed in a really healthy society. Because everyone would be taking of their <laughs> kids, taking care of them. So if that's what you're fighting towards, that's a lot different than, you know, fighting towards a healthy society where everyone takes care of their kids and everyone loves each other and takes care of each other. That's kind of a lot more fulfilling of a goal, I think, than having to deal with sexual abuse all the time, which is what you're going to have to do as a social worker. But I mean, you're going to burn out pretty quick, too. I like the metaphor of a research island. I've seen it as an iceberg. Yeah, but, same thing. But this, I think, <laughs> captures better, like more starkly, the contrast of when it's winter, how that visually changes, but how the underneath stays the same, which, and then your application to changing um, what, you know, if you look different, but you still have the same. <coughs> I'm working with the traditional community in Brazil, and they're going through a huge struggle of being told that because they're changing and largely adapting to the changes around them, they should no longer get the rights ascribed to them as traditional people, because, and it's a huge issue, and, and there's a lot of fight about what's the definition of a traditional person. Well, I mean, the same fights take place so, here yeah. today <laughs> in our communities. Well, although we've moved on a lot, like, I mean, most people wouldn't say, you know, I think a lot of people would still say, like, being a trapper is a traditional, living a traditional lifestyle, but I, I have never heard anyone say, well, you don't use deadfall trap, you use, you use steel traps and you use a rifle, so you're not really a traditional Indian out there living on the trap line. <laughs> I think you'd get uh, shot down pretty quick. So it's <laughs> It's funny because we allow some things in our culture to evolve, but then we, not other things. So it's like we have to, we're a living culture. We have to adapt and change. And I think that sometimes we get stuck also in a glorification or something of the something that we think was really good in the past or something. And it's like we have to also be willing to adapt our culture and change it. And it's not stuck where it was. 50 years ago or 100 years ago, like, you know, we've allowed hunters to <coughs> use rifles and snowmobiles. What about the, us, well, those of us that work in academia? Like, um, those women of you here, you know, our way of dressing has changed. Uh, I think it's ridiculous <coughs> to say, for example, not force women to wear skirts, which is a big sort of taboo topic to bring up in a lot of Aboriginal communities right now. <laughs> if I could add well. some of the, in, in terms of the decolonization, one piece is that in order for us to have, to be able to step forward, speak the way you are in terms of our own culture and defining our culture and allowing our culture to, to grow, there has to be space, there has to be room for that to happen. It's so a part of that decolonization process, while it is a reaction against, is about creating space so that people are safe enough to, to grow, to develop. An example would be um, that within the university here, indigenous peoples are trying to create space. That might be in curriculum. What's talked about within a particular class, or it might be actual physical space, like maybe the academic, where people feel safe and can contribute. When there's a sense of 
that people have a, uh, that safety or that room, then they're more at ease to be able to contribute to the development and growth of our culture. So I think decolonization is also important, but it isn't the only thing. There's some authors talking about uh, indigenism, or Dauru talks about radical indigenism, or indigenous perspectives. Do you have any thoughts about that? That those the words I use not to. <laughs> I, I guess the reason I've, I've moved away from using things like an indigenous research paradigm is, you know, just with the recognition that so many Western paradigms are really exclusive. So it's like most Western research disenfranchises women, it doesn't allow for queer theory, it doesn't allow for anyone that's different to be included. And, I, and I, to me, an indigenous philosophy is based on the idea of love and action. It's like, well, how is excluding anyone practicing love, it's not. So I've started, I've changed what the words I use and start trying to use, sometimes I misspeak, but I intend to use the word indigenous usually if I'm talking about a philosophy rather than people. Because it's a name for a philosophy rather than, I'm not claiming it as exclusively for indigenous people because I know that a lot of non-indigenous people say, well, that's exactly what I believe too. And so I'm something like, that's fine, that's great. It's just like I think, Close analogy may be, it's like, you don't have to be a woman to be a feminist, okay? You don't have to be indigenous to be an indigenous or to follow indigenous philosophy. <laughs> if that's the beliefs that you have and that's the philosophy that you hold, then that's fine. Yeah. Um, I like use, I like, again, I like your metaphor. And um, I like when you use that to express a lot of scientific research and when you talk about the visible part of scientific research like data collection. And <coughs> the visible part of our research, which, is, which as you mentioned, our beliefs and our understanding. I'm really not sure or agree with you when you say the invisible part of our research is our belief. Don't you think that may be a source of bias when we build our research on our beliefs? Mm -hmm. It seems to me it could be a source of bias when I guide my research or guide my research based on my beliefs or my understanding. So can you explain a little bit what yeah. you mean by that? I would say that that invisible part is always there. Mm -hmm. It's just that some people recognize it and some people don't. Mm -hmm. A lot of Western research just starts with the assumption that it's unbiased and that it's purely objective, but it's not. Western science has a hidden set of beliefs behind everything that they do too. They just don't talk about it very often. Um, so, I think all, all research is biased. There's no such thing as unbiased research, just because that's the way the world works. You know, you wouldn't choose a research topic unless you had a personal interest in it. That's introducing bias. There is no such thing as unbiased research. So I think it's a lot more honest to say, this is where I'm coming from, this is my beliefs, these are my biases. So that I, you know, if, if I'm telling you this, these are my beliefs and my biases, you can then say, you can use that to sort of filter or judge what I'm saying and see if it fits with your beliefs and biases. Rather than if I just say this is the truth and say I don't have any biases, then it's like, well, how can I judge that? <laughs> Who's paying you? Why did you choose that topic? <laughs> All of those things introduce bias, but people in Western research for some reason seem to get away with ignoring them. Well, it's not necessarily that they ignore but it's kind of like white privilege is that they don't have to um, explore them. It's just they can assume that everyone else has them too. It's, it's the same as them when they're not. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll um, do the next thing. Uh, I can't remember what the next thing is. I don't know how much I want to get into all this. <laughs> <laughs> The whole key behind indigenism, indigenous philosophy, is the idea that everything is relational. So our whole belief system, our ontology, epistemology, all those big words, um, are based on the idea that we're we are made up of and we are built from the relationships that we're in. So we're not just in relationships; we are relationships. That's why I say I'm not just Sean Wilson. What is Sean Wilson? It's like doesn't matter. I'm an uncle, I'm a father, I'm a nephew, I'm a dad, I'm a great-great-great-grandparent, um, great-great-great-great-grandson. All of those things 
relationships with different people, different families, clans, nations. Also, those relationships that hold with the land and the environment around them, because that's, I think, really important for Indigenous people, is that we are based... We're this property. We're like land-based people. <laughs> we come from a place. We come from a land. Like, I'm from the Pasquet, Cree Nation. If you look at the Cree language, like, north means going home. So we've been living in that area for thousands and thousands and tens and tens and tens of thousands of years. There's stories of us migrating south for the ice ages, right? And north means going back home. So we go back home to where our, our community is. That's our land. That's part of what makes us who we are. We hold those, we hold those relationships with the land and the environment. <coughs> You know, sometimes not all people hold good relationships with them. <laughs> you know, there's abusive relationships too. Um, but you know, we hold that relationship. We hold that relationship with ancestors, generations yet to come. <coughs> and I think as researchers, what we hold relationships a lot of time with is ideas, as abstractions. And I think maybe the easiest way to understand that is like looking at, think of your love, perhaps. It's like we all have an idea of what love is, right? And you can all sort of recognize that that idea is going to be based on what sort of relationship you have with love. So if like who you've loved in the past and sort of who's loved you, those relationships are going to influence the way you view love itself. Right? So this, that abstraction is influenced by all those relationships. But other abstractions are also influenced by relationships too, like, your, like time or physics or social work. Those are abstractions. <laughs> okay? They're all based on relationships. <clears throat> but a big important part though is, okay, if reality is made up of relationships, the important thing to consider is if you are being a good human being, you are accountable to those relationships. So when you make a relationship with something, you become accountable or when you bring a relationship into your consciousness and you also bring in a set of accountabilities to that relationship. Yeah. That's, those two points are kind of like the main points, right? We're relationships, we're accountable to those relationships. Um, I don't know if you this, you guys know all about research already, right? So you go from indigenous research paradigm, go through different steps, different methods, then you get data. It's like the trees at the top. We haven't talked about very much yet. For indigenous people, is analysis. <laughs> I'm skipping over a whole bunch of stuff here. Ask any questions if you want. But, um, there's more, actually, there's more to indigenous research methods than talking circles. Too. It's a good method. It's one method, but there's a shitload more of them. And I don't exclude or include any methods. I think they're just tools. You can use whatever tools you like, as long as they're guided by your philosophy. Same goes for analysis. There's like a shitload of different ways of analyzing data. Right? You can do like a multivariate regression analysis of a bunch of numbers. That's what you need to do. If you have a bunch of numbers, if you got a bunch of words, that's not going to work. If you got a bunch of words or concepts that you're dealing with, you have to do a different form of analysis, right? I think what we haven't been very good at yet is um, articulating indigenous forms of analysis. Um, oh, it's like tools, I guess. We, we've got a lot of different tools that we can use, like like the main tool that well, well, not most, but a lot of people use for like analyzing words is using content analysis and trying to group things into themes and stuff. It's a very good tool. Um, I think we need to sort of also start to develop some more tools and sort of start to write about them. Can you expand on that? Uh, well, I think this is just something we haven't articulated yet. I think we've done a pretty good job of articulating a couple of good, useful research methods of gathering information, but I don't think we've articulated yet how we analyze stuff. We mean those indigenous, indigenous scholars, like indigenous researchers. Yeah. 
So that's something that we're trying to talk about a few of us. Yeah. And looking at different forms of analysis. So I think I, I agree with you that we need more, we need to spend more time with that. Yeah. When you mentioned about using many or variety of tools that are out there, I think it's also important that we analyze how or which tools we're going to use and how we're going to use them. So for example, if we use a, a t-test, that comes from a very different way of thinking. Yeah. thought about how to link the philosophical pieces to different ways of doing analysis? Mm, not really. Well, I've, I've thought about it a lot, but I haven't come up with any answers. Um, and that's, I, you know, this is where it's at. This is the breaking frontiers of where things are happening, I think, is in the analysis part. Um, to me, there's something about, it's like, we have to get past a linear logic form of analysis where it's like A leads to B leads to C, and somehow be able to articulate how intuitive logic works, it's not, but it's not just intuitive, it's, there's also a logic to it, but I just don't know how to articulate the logic, it's like a web logic where it's like, you know, A, B, B C, D, E, F, G, somehow come up with Z, but it's not a linear process. Um, and there's something else that's like to do with cumulative analysis because I think there's a recognition, you know, when when ideas and, and research things are formed in a relationship, there's a recognition that if I'm in a relationship with you talking about analysis, the result of that is a joint thing. It's not something that I own. I may be the one who writes it down on paper, but it is a cumulative process. And I think especially if you start to analyze things as a group that it's really difficult to document how that works. It's like there's like a gestalt there where you know the sum of the pieces is greater than the individual. You know what I mean? <laughs> the whole is greater than the sum of the parts of it, right? When you do a cumulative thing. So there's that happening with a lot of time with analysis too. And I but I don't know how to articulate it or write it. Other than, you know, I'm trying, but it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> is, is there a pretty word that would be equivalent to the Gestalt idea concept? Quite possibly, but I don't know. <clears throat> when you talk about analysis, analysis um, that's something that I've been really thinking about and sort of struggling with, because trying to define something that's outside of the mainstream literature first is very good. But for me, it's about that philosophy that you talked about. Like that's a big problem because um, if, if you think about I'm thinking about it in terms of doing storytelling, so listening to the stories and, and recording those, and then looking at them to see whether they fit with the stories from our communities, whether they fit with um, the philosophy, the teachings, and that. Like, but to me, that's if they match with that. Then to me, that's <coughs> yeah, yeah, but it, then it's also a process of how do you decide whether or not they fit, and who makes that decision, and what criteria do you use to? <coughs> yeah, and that's going back to. Yeah, yeah, and it needs to be articulated better. I think I think that's something we all need to get better at writing up. So um, I have the privilege of using your group um, when I was out at the University of Victoria to use your textbook. Your book is a textbook. And so I spent a fair amount of time with it. And one of the things that when you said you pick up a book and start to read it, it was what I do, is, is um, try to see if you find where the author's coming from and where the philosophy is coming from, right? So you talked a lot about relationship and really really made that solid in terms of how you indicate and understand about life, but also about research. And I noticed um, a lot of where you came from was your father's scam. He was a big part of your experience and your knowledge was in, in the community. So that, um, to me, helped connect you back to your community. And for me, that was, that was real. 
Yeah, yeah. I have to acknowledge that. Yeah, my parents are. I come from a, a place of real privilege, and I sort of recognize it because it's like I don't know very many other Aboriginal people have two professors for parents. So it's kind of like I'm kind of cursed with having to do this kind of work, I guess. <laughs> 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 well, I, I, you know, I recognize that uh, you know it is a privilege. You know, that's you don't talk about white privilege. It, this is an honored privilege that I have. That I was really blessed in my upbringing to have parents that were able to teach me a lot of this stuff. So. And they were teaching me culture as well. Yeah. So that was, that yeah. Was yeah. And that's a blessing as well. That I, that I, One of the questions I'm wondering is that what role do you think research, indigenous research plays in our own self-determination as indigenous peoples? Both ideally locally and globally, but well, whatever way you think. To me, that's the biggest role it plays is because unless we're doing indigenous research, we're letting other people decide what our future is going to be, right? You know, if we can use indigenous research and use the business stuff that's guided by our own philosophy to guide where we want to go, then it's us guiding us where we want to go rather than someone else telling us where we should go. And I think that's a big difference, distinction I mean, also made between um, indigenous research and research that's done on indigenous people. Right? Um, that, you know, there's a lot of people that do research on indigenous people. What it's doing really is creating more mainstream knowledge of indigenous people. It's not building indigenous science. But we have our own body of science. Science is just like a structured body of knowledge, right? We have our own structure around our science. Mainstream studies of indigenous people do nothing to add to that body of knowledge. It's indigenous research that adds to that indigenous knowledge base, indigenous science. So it's like traditional indigenous knowledge is growing knowledge base. It's, not, it's again, not something that's stuck in the past, right? This is traditional indigenous knowledge is happening. That, and that's how we grow it. And then if, if we use, if we grow and use that knowledge to guide where we want to go in the future, then it's like we're deciding where we want to go rather than letting someone else tell us where we want to go. Well, I guess uh, I just wanted to kind of make a comment in regards to um, recognizing the knowledge that is coming out of the communities and uh, the current uh, I guess when you're looking at like relationships that individuals have with the land and the knowledge that they have had passed on to them uh, through their uh, parents, grandparents, so on and so forth, um, that is something that's not necessarily being recognized within uh, institutions across this country or even globally speaking. So when you're looking at like indigenous research methods, I think that's something that's not really being taken into consideration that uh, somebody that has a classroom of living on the land or being having relationships with the land compared to being in a classroom setting, I think that's something that we see recognized currently within Western society. Because yeah. yeah. you learn, you learn a whole different set of mm -hmm. ways of relating to things when you're relating to a living environment. You, like I mean, you're still relating to each other in here, mm -hmm. yeah. but you're also relating a lot to sort of books, right? <laughs> not really about living knowledge. <laughs> They're knowledge, but it's not necessarily living. Oh, she read behind the first thing. <laughs> I was just wondering how you feel or how you've noticed um, forces that have uh, power, so to speak, in terms of uh, economics, political power, et cetera, et cetera, have responded to indigenous research and whether that's working to create action or whether it's being respected. Uh, not as much as I would like it to be, but it is being respected a lot, a lot more than it has been in the past. You know, it's like Michael was talking about. It's like opening up decolonization. Actually, has really opened up a lot of space for indigenous knowledge to sort of take place in. The uh, but that's just the academy. I think that with any power, it's going to be like. Whoever holds those power, there's different views of how power works, right? You can talk about scarcity paradigm or whatever. But people that follow that scarcity paradigm, if they want 
someone else is getting powerful, it means it's taking away power from them. And so that's you know how a lot of lateral violence works too. It's like you can gain power by cutting else someone someone else down. Unfortunately, that's a lot of how Western society works. Um, so it's kind of in a lot of people's best interest to keep people disenfranchised. But not everyone believes that, and I think there's a lot of people that are, that, you know, empowerment works to the power, increases the power of both parties. You come from a different paradigm, so why not empower other people because it'll make everyone more powerful. It's not like a limited resource. That makes sense. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't really answer your question. I was just like, yeah, I was just generally wondering what your experiences of uh, how well respected you feel the research is in terms of those, who, like, from those who have power yeah. in terms of, you know, economic, political change and whatnot. It's, I say, respected by some, but probably not respected by more. Yeah, I was just thinking of like just the analysis and like when I work with storytellers, like storytellers talk about putting the story out there and then there's a lot of um, uh, interest in or there's a lot of um, words here, uh, trust put in the audience to take that story and determine what it needs to then and what truth is it, it there is. But if you look at an academic paradigm and we're saying talking about this analysis, then the researcher is expected to take those stories. Like that's our job, right? Is to say put out there what that means. So there's kind of a tension between those yeah. those two ideas of knowledge as far as trusting the audience and you're the expert that has to say what it all what it all means. So how do you how have you dealt with that in your work? Not, not well. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's the yeah, it's exactly, and it's a, I think it's a different style of discourse, right? Like you can talk about discourse analysis as a, as a way of looking at this. One way of talking is that you lead your discussion to a definite conclusion that probably you, as the audience, are nowhere I'm going to get to before I get to the end. Often Western styles of speech really work this way. So it's like people can start talking right away as soon as you're done because they already know what your conclusion is going to be because it's like A plus B plus C leads to B, right? And it's like, oh yeah, everyone knows that. But indigenous ways of talking, especially like if you talk with a lot of elders, it's like a totally different way of talking where they'll just bring up a couple of random stories. <laughs> <laughs> not necessarily really random, but they may seem random at the time. And it's like, you may not get the point of what they're talking about until a couple of days later or a couple of years later. But usually it's like when they're talk, stop telling a story, it's everyone will stop and think about it for a little while before someone else says something else. And it may be like a totally another random different story. But for them, it was, oh yeah, that makes me think about this. And then they can tell a story that's why they're thinking about that. Um, but you get those long pauses in the conversation because people have to stop and think about it. That, that, oh, that reminds me of this. Oh, yeah, okay, then, then they can draw their own conclusions. It's not like they've been led to a conclusion that they're forced to either agree with or disagree with. It's like you're for, you have to come up with your own conclusion, right? And it's, it's your conclusion, so you, no one else is going to agree or disagree with it because it's yours. <laughs> is that? Yeah. But, yeah, it's problematic trying to <laughs> translate between the two different ways of doing stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering back about the indigenous piece. In one of your comments in the beginning, is that anybody can practice indigenous? So, in order to be able to do that, you have to be able to come from philosophy, and that means that having some understanding of the beliefs, understanding some of the values, okay. some of the practices that extend from that. So, I'm always cautious about that. Because uh, I think about a, a good friend of mine, a non-indigenous fellow, who spent who spent now close to three decades with us in terms of ceremonies, involvement, etc. And to this day, I can tell that he still doesn't quite have it. He still comes from a very Western perspective. But I don't know because he's older. I don't know if he's going to get there. So. 
is there any risks involved in saying that anyone can practice from an indigenous perspective? And if there is, how do we how do we address those risks? How do we make sure it's the indigenous peoples that are defining the Well, there is a difference. It, if you're doing indigenous research, you're not going to be doing research on someone else. Okay. Why not do indigenous research on your own group? I don't, like I was just talking to the the, uh, the vice president of Red River Colleges, the Korean American, and he uses indigenous research, but he uses it on his own group. Okay. Well, that's fantastic. <laughs> it's not because he's naming an indigenous, because he likes the idea it's based around relationships, and that's something that he understands from his culture and his way of doing things. So he's applying it to the research that he does in his group. Um, you know, and I would say the sort of same thing happens with a lot of indigenous people. <laughs> you know, it's their whole life, and they still get the bells going on. <laughs> I can go to a lot of different ceremonies, and it's like, uh, well, what <laughs> just happened? <laughs> it's not. <coughs> yeah, it's not race based. I don't think. I, I kind of. I recognize that racism exists and race is put on us, but I don't really believe in the whole concept of race. It's an external imposed thing. Um, so it's quite. You know, it's the upbringing you have. People aren't going to be necessarily fluent in this philosophy. Just because they happen to be born to Aboriginal parents. Um, you know, and it, like any philosophy, you have to learn about stuff. Yeah, then so you think, I mean, wouldn't you want it to be such that more people could follow that philosophy because if you want to make positive change and so forth. It's the same as, like you said earlier, it equates to feminists. You don't need to be a woman. You need to believe that no group should be oppressed, right? And, same as people working in disability studies, like to have informed allies who aren't necessarily people with disabilities. Yeah. And it shouldn't just be like people with disabilities arguing for their rights because they yeah. need support. I think that brings an important point that you just mentioned that indigenous research that isn't just a dynamic of an indigenous person who's an indigenous philosophy when you do research with indigenous peoples. That there's a whole other dynamic that's involved in this, and that's the role of uh, decolonizing peace, uh, space peace, and what's the role of people who, um, uh, who want to create change, such as social workers, who want to create change in support of indigenous people. So there's a role for everybody to be playing. There's activities for everybody. So that means we all have responsibilities in these processes. And I, I, you know, Actually, what you said before that and what you said sort of also tied it together for me. It's like, you know, I can be a feminist, but I'm not going to tell a woman what to do. <laughs> so being an indigenous, using, follow, following indigenous philosophy doesn't give me the right to tell another indigenous person what to do. Well, that, that, that's why it's kind of like, you know, we have to be careful. And like you used to say, just because someone says they're following indigenous philosophy doesn't necessarily mean that they get, have the right, therefore, to uh, say what happens in the indigenous communities is just a form of paternalism. Yeah, and it's kind of a hard line. Like, I do work with people with disabilities and disability studies, but I don't want to take, I would never say I'm speaking for. For them, yeah. Right? Yeah. And also, I don't want to take space yeah. to from other people. So, for example, with jobs and things like that, it sort of is sometimes a hard line when you're working with a group that you don't entirely belong to. We have time maybe for one more question. Um, like I did my research with indigenous peoples in Central Asia, that's where I'm originally from. And uh, I participated in women's ceremonies a lot. And uh, in ceremonies and rituals, there is a lot which is nonverbal communication, like silence, laughter. And it's so hard to, like, I think as a participant and, and as a researcher like it's so hard to create meaning like I have my own meaning they have their own meaning and everyone has their own meaning in that ceremony and as and I used your research methodology in my dissertation however I used content analysis and I felt that there is such a strong detachment and I was trying to bring uh, meaning that the women tried to be but I also feel that I like 
I feel that the format of dissertation is uh, not conducive to indigenous voices. It's very structured, it's very linear, it, and it, you should write results and then findings. And I think the analysis, like, uh, it's an exercise of power over people who you work with. And uh, I don't think there, there should be a space for our own analysis. Like, I remember when I started my education in Western institution, I used to study in the United States, I would write women's stories, and there will be no paragraph including women's, like, the analysis. And I remember professors marking and saying, like, you need one more paragraph to them too. And when I started my PhD, I did the same. And I was like, and I was struggling to write these conclu uh, paragraphs, uh, concludings, uh, these ideas. And I think we just need to like decolonize our uh, like guidelines, rules to create a space for proper research as well. Yeah. Is that, and I totally agree with that. And another, sp another side of it that I would say also is, so part of your journey as a researcher is finding your own voice. So I think that it's really good to put people's, other people's voices on. But sometimes it's also a matter of saying, this is my story now. These women have all shared their stories with me, and now it's become my story, and this is how I tell my story. So it's like I take some of their story as incorporated into my being of who I am, and this is my story now. So that's, for me, that was a really important part of how I wrote that book is, this is my story now, and it's like changed me as a person. So I always say, like, if you, if research doesn't change you as a person, then you haven't done it right. Okay. So you can talk about that change in you as a person, may be the concluding <laughs> remark. So it's not changing their story, it's but it's saying this is how it's changed me. With that, I'm gonna end up. I think uh, perhaps the better word than analysis is synthesis. And something I'm writing with others is trying to push the idea of synthesis instead of analysis, which emphasizes a great thing now. With that, well, I wanted to say thank you. We have a small gift here for you for uh, joining us. <laughs>